Welcome back everyone for today's video. We are going to be taking a look at day six, the final day of the battle of generations, which is taking place in Stockholm, Sweden, between the famous YouTuber and aspiring grandmaster candidate, Levy Rosman and grandmaster Pia Kramling from Sweden. Now, yesterday we did a nice recap of the first five games being played in the rapid portion due to chess.com and their great site. Um, I actually thought there were only five games when it turned out there were six. So we're going to start out our recap with a final game from the rapid portion and Pia playing with the white pieces, Levy with the black pieces, Levy on a three game winning streak and really taking a big lead in the match. So the game starts out with D4. We get to move Knight F6, C4, E6, Knight F3, and now we have D5 from Levy. Here Pia plays Knight C3 and Levy plays move Knight BD7. And now we get this move Bishop G5. Here, Levy plays bishop b4, correcting one of his errors in the earlier game, which we covered, where he was playing, I believe it was h6, bishop h4, and then a bishop b4, if I remember correctly, or maybe it was cd, ed. At any rate, he plays a system which is considered to be pretty salt. So we get takes, takes. Now we get e3. Levy plays c5 here. Also an improvement, because in the previous game, which I mentioned in yesterday's recap, he put the pawn on c6. But one of the reasons you want to bring the bishop out to b4 right away is so that you can play c5. Pia plays queen c2. We get the move queen a5, and now we have the move bishop d3. Here, Levy goes c4. We get bishop f5, castles, castles, and now we have the move rook e8. Now, all this pretty standard theory. I remember studying this quite heavily back in 2011 when I was working with Gary Kasparov. This position very, very dynamic here. Both sides have the two bishops on the board, but there's a lot to play for. So Pia goes rook fb1. Levy plays move h6, and now we get the move bishop to h4. White obviously does not want to trade off the bishops, because now after takes, takes, for example, this e4 square is very juicy for the horse. Say you go like h3, let's just say takes, takes, b6, just to illustrate the point. If you get this knight to e4, suddenly the pawn on c3 is a big weakness here for white to deal with. And if anything, black should be better. So after h6, we get bishop h4, Levy plays a6, now we get the move a3, we have bishop takes knight, pawn, queen takes bishop, takes, takes, and now we get the move b5. Now again, one thing that I've stressed in a lot of my recaps recently on this match is that for Pia Kramling, it feels like she is really trying very hard to go into positional scrambles, get these games away from the big tactical situations. And I think in general, it has benefited her greatly for the most part in that she's getting good positions. She is outplaying Levy pretty consistently in a lot of these positional games, but of course, at the end, when time gets low, things have kind of gone wrong in spite of that. So we get a4 here. Levy plays move knight b6. Now, it's interesting because the computer says after g5, bishop g3, and knight b6 here, black is actually doing very well because now the bishops are sort of facing each other. If white were to trade here, for example, after takes, takes, sorry, wrong work. After takes, 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 if white were to takes, takes, and take on b5, now there is rook to a1, creating a classic kebab and checkmating the white king. And if white plays something like h3, for example, here, now black can go knight to a4, followed by knight to e4. And look at these knights. They are super active here. Black is going to get a pass pawn going up the board as well. And black should be close to winning. So after a4, Levy instead plays move knight b6. And now Pia decides to trade anyway. Now there's a big difference here, which is that after takes, now white can trade the bishop for the knight on f6. And it's very similar to the previous example, except now the bishop and the knight are gone. You no longer can jump with the knight to e4. And you have these stacked pawns on top of each other. So from a technical standpoint, white is much better. So here Pia plays a5. Levy goes knight d7. Keep in mind, just to go back to that other line very briefly here, if we got this position with a5, black would go knight a4. Because after rook to a three now there's knight to e4 and look at the knights hitting the pawn now back in the game here after a5 black was knight a4 rook a3 there is no longer knight to e4 so this knight on a4 is completely out of the game as both these squares are unable to uh, receive the knight so after a5 knight e7 pia plays knight to h4 moving with the knight towards the edge but back towards the center where you can start forking every every pawn and every rook we get to move knight to b8 knight f5 and now levy goes king h7 here Pia plays f3, we get knight c6, and now we get this move e4. Great positional understanding from Pia up to this point, building the big white center here. Really, really good position. And now we get pawn takes pawn, pawn takes pawn, and rook to g8. Now, Levy is much worse in the situation. He's down five minutes on the clock. For Pia in many of these games, it feels like she's getting an advantage. But the problem is that the critical moments when she spends the time, she isn't able to find the knockout blow, and she has been struggling and eventually blundering some of the games away. So we get king to f2. Rook a8 is played, we get rook a1, and now we get to move b4 from Levy. Another good move to try and open up the queen side here, start activating the horse, and it's starting to feel like this is getting a bit out of hand. 
So Pia plays rook a4. Levy plays rook b8. We get king to f3. And now we have the move rook d8. Now king f3 is a move that's not precise, but it's a very understandable move here from Pia. She's trying to play very technical, play quiet moves, improve her position. And this, the, even though this isn't best, I actually rather like it. So we get rook bd8. Pia plays king to e3. We get rook to b7. And now we have the move rook c1 being played. Now, one thing that I would also caution about, and I'm not trying to be really critical here, is it feels like Pia, in many of the situations where there's a critical moment or critical move, she, she struggles between using the time to try and find the best move and sometimes just moving instantly to avoid having to think and putting the pressure on the clock uh, back on Levy's side. So this is one of those situations where d5 is actually just winning for white because after knight e5, rook takes b4. Let's just say takes takes, for example. White has an extra pawn on the queen side after rook b8 and rook b1, and white should win the game. You can also try to create the wide peepos going up the board as well. Instead, we get this move rook to c1. Levy plays knight e7. We get the move rook takes b4. Now, this move is surprisingly um, wrong. White is apparently supposed to take here and play rook takes b4. Honestly, I don't blame P in this case for playing this. She probably thought, well, rook e8. Suddenly the rooks are coming through on the file. What am I doing? But amazingly, after takes, rook takes e4, king d3. Black goes rook e2. There's rook c7, followed by king c4, and white is winning. And after and if black goes check, you go king c2, check king b3. Let's just say black takes, for example. Now you can go rook to c6, hitting both of the pawns. You start pushing your pawns up the board. These two connected pawns are much better than the split black pawns on the king side. So instead, we get rook b4. Levy trades, rook e7, king f2, rook d5. And suddenly, it's getting very tricky here. Levy has created sufficient counterplays, targeting both the pawns on f5, a5. Their ideas with kebabs on the second rank. Active rooks here. And now I started to worry that Pia might not even win the game. So we get g4. We have rook takes a5. We get this move rook to c2 being played by Pia. And here we have the move rook c7 guarding the pawn. Pia continues with rook b6. We get king g7, rook b8. And now we have the move h5 being played. Pia plays rook to e2 here. And this is a very serious mistake. Now, again, Pia is a minute 20 more on the clock at this point in the game. But she's probably thinking, you know what? I'm just going to keep moving quickly. I'm going to go for it. Because she probably in her mind has already accepted that if she gets low on time, she's going to inevitably blunder at some point. And so it's better to just go for it, keep the time advantage and try to press on. Now, the computer would prefer king to f3 here, guarding the pawn and preparing rook e2 or rook g2, but she goes rook e2. You get takes, rook e8, takes, and now the move king g3. Now, the funny thing about this one is that even though what Pia has done is inaccurate, Levy is low on time here, and it's very hard to deal with the threats of the rooks on the back rank here and the black king on g7, which is very, very loose. So Levy here plays rook g5. This is a big blunder that loses the game. I don't really blame him. At this point, he's low on time. The only way to survive is to go rook f1 here because if white were to check, for example, and check with both of d's rooks, now the king escapes to f5, e4, and d3, and black actually would be winning here. And if, if white were to capture on g4 here, now you have f5 checking the king. If the king goes back, now you can simply play rook to c6, stopping any checks on the sixth rank. And after check king f6, the king is completely safe. It's at home here on the square, and black should win the game. Or maybe it wins too strong, but black won't lose. Instead, Levy goes rook g5 here. He probably saw rook g8, king h6, check king g6, and he thought, well, if check check on g8, the king escapes to f5, and I'm fine. Very logical. However, Pia finds the winning move here, king to f4, and the reason this move is winning is now the idea of checkmate with rook h8 and rook g8 is simply unstoppable because this king covers a critical square. If black were to go f5, you hang the rook in the game. Of course, the idea behind f5 to create the square on f6. If you move the rook, if you, if you play anything else, which Levy does, he just plays rook h5. Now you get mated, check, check, and rook to g8 checkmate. So, Great stuff. Um, great stuff here. Great stuff here from um, from Pia. She gets a very big win in the final rapid game of the day to move back into a reasonable situation. She's down 14 to 10. She lost the three middle games before winning the final game. Um, she loses by a score of, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, four to two. Four to two sounds right. Um, in the rapid portion, there were two draws. Levy won the three in a row, and then Pia won the final game of rapid. So she's down 14 to 10 going into it. So she's down 14 to 10 at the end of the rapid portion. And now we move to the blitz portion. So down by four points, 12 blitz games, each, each game worth one point. P is going to need a massive miracle to come back in this match. Now, as I said at the end of my recap yesterday, I have this feeling that Levy is very likely to win in the bullet portion. In fact, I'm hoping it won't become a blowout. So let's see what happens. Now, players are playing three minutes, two second increment. Pia must win by a score of eight to four to tie the match or, or more in order to win. So first game, game number 11 of the match, first blitz game, Levy with the white pieces, and it starts out with the move d4. We get the move d5 here, and now we get the move knight to f3. 
And here we have knight f6 being played. After knight f6, we get bishop to f4. Now we have c5 being played, and here Levy goes e3. After e3, we get to move knight to c6, and now we have to move knight to 2. Now, all this stuff is... Um, all this stuff is, of course, the classic uh, London system from Levy. He's been playing this with great effectiveness thus far in the match. The game continues with the move knight to h5. Levy goes bishop e5, and now we get the move e6. Now, yesterday, Pia played f6 in that fateful fifth uh, fifth um, rapid game of the match, and she lost a game which was not great. So today, she plays e6. Levy goes c3 here. This, of course, is a mistake, by the way. I do want to point out that here, the correct move is to play c4. This has been played in a lot of top-level grandmaster games. Um, but Levy instead goes c3. Now, after f6, bishop g3 and g6. Black is already a little bit better here because black will be able to trade the knight for the darks for b on g3, finish the development, have the two b's, and potentially build a big black center. So we get bishop e2. Pia trades. We get knight takes d4, takes, takes. Now we get e5, takes, takes. Here we have queen c2, and Pia plays move f5. Now, yesterday, Pia made a blunder with this move bishop g7, a little bit different than this position because it was a bishop on d3, but if she were to play this move bishop g7, white can sack the rook once again on h7, and after takes queen g6, it would be very, very similar to the game she lost yesterday. Instead, she plays f5, stopping this threat towards the pawns on h7 and g6, and suddenly you have this massive big black center, you have the two bishops, and this is a position that is fantastic for black. That being said, it is a blitz game, and one of the things that I would caution about in blitz versus classical chess or even slower rapid formats is that here white has easy moves. White wants to castle, play knight f3, maybe g4, maybe c4. Very little to think about. For black, you have to figure out just where you want to put the bishops, where you want to put the king, and it's just not as simple. So you're going to have to spend some time, and you could get into trouble. So we get the move castles here from Levy. Pia plays move queen a5. Levy goes king b1, and now we get the move bishop e6. Now already here, in the course of two moves, Pia Kramling has thrown away the advantage completely, and this really does illustrate the difference between the faster formats and classical chess, where if this were classical, I have no doubt that Pia would take her time, come up with the best setup, and very likely win this game. But in a blitz game, you have to move quickly, and so queen a5 makes sense just to hit the pawn, but after king b1, bishop e6, and knight b3, queen b6, and c4, suddenly now black has to figure out what the plan is again, whereas for Levy, you play on the h file, maybe g4, maybe d file, maybe c file. Very little to think about, so you're not going to, um, so you should be able, I shouldn't say not, you should be able to um, prove uh, some, some great chances. So we get the move a5 here from Pia. Levy trades on d5, and now he plays move a4. Now, this is not great here, but a4 does support the bishop jumping to the b5 square and hitting the king on e8. Pia plays rook to c8. We got the move bishop to b5 here, and now we have king f7. Levy goes queen d3, Pia plays bishop g7, and here Levy goes for the move f4. Now at this point, Levy is down 40 seconds on the clock, but it's a very, very sharp situation here where white still has pressure on the h7 pawn, still can go rook c1, and it's anybody's ball game. So we get e4, Levy plays queen d2, we get the move d4, and now Levy plays move knight takes pawn. After and in this situation, I really, I don't know if I really like e4 here. Honestly, if I were playing with black, I'd probably play something like h5 and rook d8 right away, or maybe even h6 and rook d8 here. Um, I don't really like e4, queen d2, because now white threatens to put the knight on d4. And here, Pia goes all in with the pawn thrust. Now, this is a pawn sacrifice from Pia here, trying to create counterplay, and we get to move rook c d8. Levy plays queen to c3. We got the move bishop takes knight. Now here already, I think for Pia, she's probably feeling the pressure. She knows she's made a mistake. She's down a pawn. The king is weak. White can go bishop c4. It's very hard to play, and she blunders with the move bishop takes knight. Here, Levy takes with a rook. We got takes, takes, and now Pia plays this very unfortunate move, h5 here. And now after d5, Pia resigns the game due to the classic fossil here. You hit the rook and the bishop at the same time. If you move the rook away, white takes the bishop, extra b on b5, easy win. If you take the pawn, then you're sacking the rook, but it's a bad sack of the rook because now you're just missing the rook and you're going to resign anyway. So a very unsatisfying end to this first Blitz game. I think it really symbolizes, again, I'm going to say this a few more times in the recap too, most likely, how difficult it is to play fast chess as you get older because you have to make these decisions. You make quick decisions. Sometimes you think too long. Sometimes you move too quickly. Finding that balance is extremely hard to do. So Levy gets a big win in the first Blitz game. Now we're going to take a look at the second game. Levy now is within a couple of points of winning the match here. He's up 15 to 10. I believe the magic number is 19, if my math is correct. Um, but he's up by a score of 15 to 10. 
So second game, Pia with the white pieces. She opens with d4. We get d5, knight of three, knight of six, c4, e6. And now we have the move knight c3. Levy plays knight d7. We get bishop g5. And here he plays the move c6. Now it's very clear that at this point in the match, Levy is on cruise control. He's able to play these opening setups very, very frequently in this match now. And he's getting very comfortable. Now c6 is not a good move, by the way, in this position. Um, it's considered, I believe, to be slightly dubious, potentially. Maybe it's still okay after e3, queen a5. Um, but it's not the best setup. But Levy at this point probably wants to also have some fun. He's played h6. He's played bishop b4. You kind of don't want to repeat the same opening system over and over again, especially when you have a big lead in the match at this point. So we get c6. Pia goes e3. Levy plays bishop to d6. And this is where I would say that if you're trying to be theoretically precise, queen to a5 is the best move, followed by dc4 or bishop b4, trying to go into the classic Cambridge Springs variation. Instead, we get bishop to d6. Pia plays bishop d3. We get takes, takes. Levy plays b5. And now we get bishop d3. And Levy plays bishop b7. Now, this, of course, would be completely fine if the white bishop were on c1. Um, just to go back for a second, if you get this position, let's just say knight c3, c6, e3, something like this, for example, takes, takes, bishop d6, castles, and bishop b7. Black is completely fine in this position. It's a very standard line. I've played this with both colors and over, uh, over the long course of my career, and, and it's just a normal position. But with the bishop being on g5 back in this position here, after castles, castles, and rook c1, black has a huge problem here because of this pin of the bishop on the knight of the knight on f6. So here we get a6 from Levy. Pia plays knight to e4. Levy goes back. Pia takes. We get takes. And now we get the move knight c5. Now, the funny thing is that if Levy were a were a Slav player here, he most likely would know that he should take with a pawn so he can take this knight with a knight or the bishop on c5, but instead he takes with a knight. Now we get knight to c5, takes, takes, and at this point, this is the dream for Pia Kramlin. This bishop is walled in by the pawns on c6 and a6. It's not active at all, and from a technical standpoint, this is very, very hard to play. So Levy goes h6. Pia plays knight to e5. We get rook c8. Bishop b1, knight d7, and now we get the great move, queen c2, threatening the checkmate with a double a battery. Levy goes f5, we get takes, takes, and after f4 here, this is just a massive, massive positional advantage. You have a terrible bishop walled in by the pawns. White can line up the triple stack. There's a, there's a3 and bishop to a2 to hit the pawn on e6, and white is just completely winning. So Levy goes queen d6. Pia plays a3, a5, bishop a2, we get king h8, rook c1, rook d8, and now we have the move rook e5. Of course, Pia playing this absolutely perfectly. She's got the diamond hands formation here with the pawns and the rook, queen c5 incoming as well, e6 weak. This is just a dream. So we get rook f6. Pia plays rook back to c5. Not sure why she did this, by the way. I personally would have gone queen c5 here, but she goes back, probably worried about seeing the boogeyman where there might be some c5 rook g6 idea hitting the pawn on g2. So she goes back to c5, which isn't best, but nonetheless, because of the placement of black's pieces, this is still very, very bad. So we get rook g6. Pia plays queen f2. We get queen e7. And now we have the move bishop b3. Levy goes queen d6. And here Pia plays bishop d1, rerouting the bishop to the f3 square, hitting the pawn on c6. And now white is going to win some material. We get b4. We get a4, bishop a6. And this simply loses on the spot. I don't know if Levy just, just played this move and he missed it that rook takes c6 would end the game, um, but he just plays this move. Pia, however, plays move b3, and this is simply very, very confusing to understand. I don't know if the players are maybe tired at this point or what's going on, but rook takes c6 just ends the game. The rook guards guard each other. The queen is under attack. The bishop's under attack. What can you do? You move the queen, you lose, lose the bishop, down a lot of material. GG, why not? However, Pia plays move b3, and this, I think, sort of speaks to the fact that at critical moments, she's just struggling sometimes to find the right move. We got bishop d3. Pia plays bishop to f3, we get bishop to e4, takes, takes, and now we have the move rook takes pawn. Now this move is still good, but honestly, if I were playing with white here, I'd probably take the pawn on a5 just to create the pass pawn, and then next turn or two, just go back, hit this pawn, and now I've got the free pawn on the a file. Instead, she takes on c6, Levy plays queen d5, we get rook c4, queen h5, and now we have the move queen d2. Levy plays king h7, we get rook to c5, and here he plays queen g4. Now at this point, it's still completely winning for white, but Levy has actually gotten a lot more play than he should have, because he's got the double stack on the g5, you can try to push h5, h4, h3, and even though white has all this, all these uh, extra pawns on the queen side, it's still not over. So we get takes, Levy goes h5, we get rook c5, h4, and now Pia plays move rook to h5 here. Very important that she found rook c5, by the way, because any other move, let's say you go rook c5, h4, it's still very good for white, but it's getting a little bit shaky after rook c2 and h3, g3. There might even be a queen f3 here. There might be some e5 ideas with queen f3. It's getting a little bit dangerous in this situation. 
But she finds rook c5, which is the absolute best move here. And now Levy does play h4. He could have played rook d5 to prolong the game by a few more moves. But after takes, 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 white simply has a few too many pawns. And black will lose in due time. Levy goes to h4. We get rook to h5. King g8. And now Pia plays move rook g5. We get takes, takes. And here the queen on g4 is simply trapped here by the rook on g5. No squares available for the queen without doing a Botez gambit. So you simply resign. So Levy resigns in this 12th game of the match that would take it back to an even score in the blitz portion. Now, the match would be very topsy-turvy. They would, they would start to trade games back and forth throughout the blitz portion. Levy never really losing the lead. And the last game we're going to take a look at, let me let me copy-paste this PGM that I do actually have right here so that we can, we can do this um, in, in a hurry. Uh, there we go. I think this should be good. Uh, let, let me pull this up into the window. Here we go. So last game we're going to take a look at is with the score at 18 to 13 with, with five games left in the bullet portion. Levy needing in this game to not lose in order to clinch the match. So Pia with the white pieces here. Sorry if the board is a little bit off. I'll update the little. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. Um, one second. Pia playing here with the white pieces. Levy with the black pieces. And let's jump right into the action as I do a little bit of work on the fly. So um let me let me get it set up there we go 2376 you got to see some of the behind the scenes action levy playing with the black piece there now this score is 18 13 levy up by five if he draws or wins this game the match is over so it starts with d4 levy plays d5 we get knight f3 knight f6 c4 e6 knight c3 and levy goes knight d7 we have bishop g5 bishop b4 and now we get the move e3 and levy plays h6 now again the players have been playing very very similar systems throughout the match um I would say that I feel for, from Levy's standpoint, his black openings against D4 are much, much better than his openings against E4. You'll notice that he has a lot more flavor and nuance. For example, he can play H6 here. He can play A6 here. He can also play Knight BD7 and C6, Bishop B4, H6. A lot of nuance and ability to play within the pawn structure here in a way that you don't have in the Karo Khan opening. So I actually think Levy's D4 openings are much, much better than his E4 openings. And I don't think he needs to do a whole lot of work on them, but his E4 openings need a lot of work and need much more flavor so we get bishop b5 bishop b4 here e3 h6 bishop h4 g5 bishop g3 and now levy plays move knight to e4 here pia plays knight e2 we get takes takes and we have the move c6 and now queen c2 at this point levy is the two b's here but white has quick development casting the king and trying to attack in the center of the board Levy goes bishop f8. We get castles. Bishop g7 here. Idea behind bishop g7, trying to prevent e4 because then the d4 pawn would be weak. So Levy goes bishop g7. We get king to b1. And here he plays move queen f6. Now, this is a terrible move from Levy in this position. What he should have done here was, oddly enough, simply castle the king followed by f5. Let's say you get f4 and f5, for example. White is probably still better here, but it's very hard to attack on this open h file because you only have one rook here. Say you go knight f3, g4, knight e5, knight f6. It looks terrible, but how do you attack? Instead, he plays queen f6, and now Pia plays move f4, and this is a fantastic positional move. It stops black from playing e5, it takes away the weakness, but it also starts to grip the square so you can get the classic diamond hands formation. Levy plays knight b6, we got bishop to d3, developing the bishop. Maybe you want to go rook f1 here, maybe you just want to go knight f3, but it's a simple move to play. Levy plays bishop d7, and now we get the move c5, Levy goes back, and here we get the move knight f3. Now, at this point, Pia is completely winning here. She is domination on the board she's putting the knight on e5 the king is passive knight is passive rooks are passive even chance to attack on the queen side here black is just doing horribly and again levy is left with a very bum bishop here on d7 which is simply walled in with no scope we get knight e7 pia plays knight e5 we get knight to f5 and now we have the move queen f2 and here levy castles the king now at this point levy is completely lost his position pia i believe had about 30 to 45 seconds more and everything's going her way but here she plays move g4 after a little bit of a think, and this is unfortunately not the best move. If P had come up with the move e4, the game would effectively be over here because you're attacking the knight. If the knight goes back to e7 here, white can trade the knight for the bishop, and then after e5, it's uh-oh, spaghetti -o time, your queen is trapped. The bishop captures the queen, pawns guard, you take, take, that's good, takes, takes, you win the game, any light square, bishop captures the queen. So you lose the game immediately. Which means that after e4, you have to take on e4. But now after knight takes e4, look at d's knights coming towards the center of the board. Queen to e7, g4. Now if you move the knight to h4, look at knight d6 check, followed by knight f7. And the knights are just forking every which way. Black is completely lost. 
So it's basically over after e4. Instead, Pia plays g4, we get knight e7, and here she plays move g3. Now this move is completely fine, nothing wrong with it, but it feels like Pia is again trying to consolidate a positional advantage here instead of trying to look for the tactical knockout. Nothing wrong with that, of course, in a classical game, but in Blitz, sometimes you have to get away from the style and go for a little bit more. Levy goes knight g6, and now we get to move queen c2. This is a mistake, of course. The best piece for white here is a knight on e5. Look at this knight. Everything is great. Even takes here, takes, and something like rook f1 would be good because this knight is still so active. But when you let black trade off the knight for the knight, and you take with the pawn, and queen e7 occurs, suddenly the pawn on c5 is weak. Suddenly there's f6 opening up the diagonal, and everything is starting to feel a little bit uncomfortable. So we get knight to e2. Levy plays f6, we get takes, takes, and now we have the move knight d4, and Levy plays move e5, opening up all the diagonals for the bishops. Now, at this point, it is clear that Levy is no longer in danger, and most likely, he's going to win the game. So Pia plays knight f5, we get takes, takes, king b8, and now we have the move rook hg1, and here Levy plays the move e4. Now, what's amazing about this position is when you look at it, look at this dark square bishop on this nice long diagonal, you have the connect four as well, and this bishop on f5, this wooden shield, is simply very passive. Bishop is staring at a lot of open diagonals, nothing you can really do. You've got the chain of four, you've got your own great bishop, and so black is simply much better. We get rook h1. Levy goes king c7. This move maybe not necessary, but his idea is simply to go rook b8 and start attacking on the b file. Personally, I probably would have gone king 8 and rook b8, but it's really anybody's choice. So we get king c7, a3. Levy plays rook b8. We get queen a4. And now we have the move queen takes c5. Pia simply hangs the pawn on c5 here, tacked the pawn on e3, but more importantly, you guard the pawn on a7. And now it's quite clear that Levy is going to win the game. We get rook e1, b5, queen b3. Queen c4 played here, and at this point, a very nice move from Levy, forcing queens off the board. He's just up a pawn, and he will win. So we get king a2, a5 played here, rook c1, and we get the very nasty move a4, attacking the queen on this diagonal, and now Pia has to trade. Levy takes with the pawn, opening up the b file for the rook and the bishop here. We get rook c2, rook b3, rook e2, rook b8, and now we have the move rook h2. Now at this point, it doesn't matter. White's completely lost. You can maybe... I was going to say move the bishop somewhere, but there really is just not much you can do, honestly, with all, all these weaknesses everywhere. You, there, it, you probably could even resign. So we get rook a shoot. Now here, Levy plays move c3, the absolute best move. We get pawn takes pawn, and here we have c takes b2 being played, as now Levy is trying to push the pawn to the end of the board and get a queen. Pia goes king b1. We get rook takes a3, and, and, and Levy, or I said Pia or Levy, I might have had the order wrong. And after rook takes a3, Pia Kramling resigns the game, because rook to a1 is simply unstoppable, checkmate in the white king. So, very, very tough loss for Pia in this game. This means that Levy takes the lead by a score of 19 to 13. Now, you're probably wondering, this recap will be released before the match is officially over. I waited until the match score is clear and Levy is going to win before doing this because I will have to bounce out and, and start playing the bullet brawl very shortly. So I just want to point that out for anybody who's like, you published this recap while it's still going on. Why did you do that? That is the reason. So a couple final thoughts about the match before we go, which is for Levy, very, very solid playing the classical portion. I think that in general, in this match, it's quite clear that he was a superior player in rapid and blitz. Even though Pia got a lot of good positions, he was definitely superior overall in the rapid and blitz. I felt that Pia was a better classical player. She defended very well in the fourth game of the match. Uh, she got the win in the first game when she sort of repelled Levy's attack. Um, however, at the end of the day, Levy was able to maintain the balance and the score was tied after classical. And I think that that's really the only portion which we can draw a whole lot of conclusions from. So for Levy, I thought he was pretty good overall in classical. Some of the same uh, ugly things reared their head where he was a little bit, a little bit unsure. He lacked some confidence, got low on time, made some blunders, um, but he was able to play, play um, pretty well. And he did maintain the balance. So from that standpoint, I think for Levy, it was a big success in classical. I think for Pia, the big thing that I would say is that it feels as though, um, you know, I, I don't really want to harp on this because it's, it's, you know, it's, it's tough saying these things and obviously it's tough watching this match. And honestly, for players who are a little bit older, one day that's going to be me, of course, like that. Well, maybe it'll be me if I play Chester and I don't retire, although I intend to uh, long before that point. Um, but for Pia, she still is great class. Even in this final blitz game, playing f4, playing knight f3, knight f5, she has great class. But for whatever reason, as you get older, the brain just slows down and things just somehow you can't put it all together the way you once could. And so for Pia, she shows how great she once was. Um, she's clearly past her prime. As someone pointed out in the comments, she became a GM, I think, before Levy was even born, which kind of says a lot um, overall. But I thought for her, she showed the great class at moments. Unfortunately, the result wasn't great for her. But I, I hope that she at least enjoyed the match overall. 
Last but not least, I think these match formats can be very interesting, uh, but it, but I think you need the right balance. You need players who are very evenly matched in all the formats because otherwise it feels like the matches become very skewed one way or the other. If someone is much better in classical and they can dominate them, the rapid and blitz don't matter. If like in this match, Levy was able to hold even in the classical portion, then the blitz and rapid actually he just dominates. He just he just he just wins uh, wins bigly. So at any rate, I think it was fun. Hopefully we'll see more of these matches. Uh, I'm trying to think of someone maybe like an Eric, maybe Eric Rosen against Levy could be an interesting interesting match just because I feel that Eric is probably close to par uh, based on some of the previous I am not a GM matches. Uh, so maybe in Blitz and Rapid are close. I think Eric may be slightly better in Rapid or not Rapid in Classical. But at any rate, it could be really exciting to see. So on that note, I hope you guys have enjoyed this recap from day six of the Battle of the Generations between Levy Rosman and Pia Kramling being held in Sweden. If you're not already subscribed to the channel, make sure that you smash that subscribe button below, and we'll be back with some more great recaps in the near future. Hope you guys enjoyed it, and have a great rest of your day. See you. Bye.